Well, good morning and welcome to our virtual life group lesson for today, April 25th. And we are continuing with our dream theme here and we're to the very next logical step, which is our commission. We are at the point where Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. You know, we've studied the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we've talked a lot about all of these things leading up to and in the weeks uh, right after Easter. And so we're at this point now where he is giving to his apostles and then to us his great commission, our commission. And so that is the title of our lesson today, and it is about telling others about Jesus. Our scripture is Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to be focusing on uh, just Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. I will reference some other scriptures to back up some of the things that we discuss, but I want us to focus on Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20. And so as you begin to uh, look at Matthew chapter 16, that's Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, I want us to unpack these two verses here because a lot of people um, assume that those who are doubting are uh, some of the eleven disciples. Let me give you a little bit of a rundown of the uh, chronology of all of the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. Um, the Bible doesn't give us a very strict chronology. It doesn't tell us, now, he appeared this point at this time of this day and so on and so forth. You can piece it together. And so as you piece it together, you can come up with this. After his resurrection, on resurrection day, that begins his appearances. And so the very first one, according to the scripture, is to Mary Magdalene. The second appearance appears to be to the women who were going to the tomb. Thirdly, to Peter. And then he appeared to two travelers, two uh, disciples who were on the road to Emmaus. And then we hear, we read, excuse me, that he appeared to all of the disciples except Thomas. Thomas was not there that day, and so the other disciples saw him, and then they told Thomas about it, and Thomas, if you remember, was doubtful. Thomas said, unless I can actually see the scar, unless I can put my hands there and feel those prints, and unless I can see it with my eyes, is what he was trying to say, I just can't quite believe it. So, the next Sunday, Jesus walks through a locked door with the disciples there, including Thomas, and he walks right up to Thomas, and he basically says, here, put your hand here, feel this in the scar, feel the wounds, and it was that point, if you remember, where Thomas declared, my Lord and my God, exclamation point, and so I have a hard time believing that at this point where we are in Matthew 28, that any of these apostles are still doubting because Thomas was the only one who had serious doubts. And after he saw Jesus resurrected in his glorified body, he had no doubts anymore. So the appearances continue though, because he appeared uh, to seven beside the Sea of Galilee, if you remember that. They ate some fish. And then it uh, you get to Matthew 28, and chronologically, it looks like this would be his eighth appearance in Matthew 28. So this is where a lot of scholars believe uh, Jesus was appearing before more than 500 brethren. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, in this list of all of his appearances post-resurrection, that at one point he appeared to more than 500 believers. And so most scholars would say that that is this point in Matthew chapter 28. Why do we say that? Because the other times don't fit. The other times 
preclude there being a crowd of that size. There were very specific appearances to specific people in small groups and small rooms and in small areas. There's no indication anywhere that there could have been a crowd. And yet here we have him on a mountaintop with a lot of people around apparently, okay? So after this appearance, which if that's the case, this would be the eighth appearance, there are at least two more because the scripture tells us that he then appears to his brother James, who as you recall, James was not a believer before the resurrection, but he is a believer after uh, Jesus appears to him and he goes on and becomes the pastor of the early Jerusalem church. He wrote the book of James. Okay. And then you have the 10th appearance of Jesus at his ascension, where he actually went up into heaven. The apostles saw him. So logically, it is most likely that this eighth appearance that we're reading about in Matthew chapter 28 is probably the one where the more than 500 were there to witness it. Why do I say that? Because again, I do think it is very doubtful that at this point, the disciples are still not sure that this is truly Jesus resurrected from the dead. Everybody who has encountered the resurrected Jesus has been, everybody who knew him well and encountered him has been thoroughly convinced. So if you have more than 500 who are believers who have shown up to worship, to see Jesus, is it possible that there are some in there who are still wavering? And if you look at the original Greek here, the Greek that is rendered doubted in my translation literally means wavered. What does it mean to waver? When you are absolutely certain this moment and then a few moments later, I don't know. I'm just not sure. Yeah, I know. No, I'm not. We waver. That is human nature. We do waver a lot. Are there people attending church today who still waver? Absolutely. There are a lot of people who attend church, but not with the absolute determination to worship. And I want you to stop and think about this because here you have the resurrected Jesus. He appears here on this mountain. The 11 disciples have been told to meet him there, so they are there. It would appear that there are 500 or more other people who have shown up. And the scripture says they worshiped him. What have we talked about? We've talked about the difference between praise and worship. Praise is speaking praise, singing praise. You, it's about what you say. It's about mostly verbal affirmation. But worship has the understanding and the meaning of prostrating oneself. To worship literally means to bow down. We sing, we read scripture that talks about worship and bow down. We don't always bow down in the sanctuary when we worship. Some of us have a difficult time physically doing that and getting back up again, okay? But you can spiritually bow down and worship even if your body does not allow you to. There is not uh, just the strict understanding that you have to physically be in a particular um, in a particular posture, but it does imply bowing, humbling oneself before God. That is what true worship is. So when I read this, I think about the fact that there's probably 500 plus people who are here. I think the disciples at this point are 100% on board, probably still in awe, in shock. They know he was dead. They know he was dead. He's not dead anymore. They've seen the scars. They know it's really him. They've talked to him. They know it is he, okay? I think they are convinced, but I think there are other people who have shown up for the worship service on the mountain who are still wavering. Maybe they didn't see him on the cross. Maybe they're not convinced that he really died and was buried. 
I don't know. But I do know, because I've been in church for my entire life, that there are people who go to church, who go to the worship service, and yet still waver in their worship. So there's nothing unusual about that. Now, I want you to um, look with me at verse 18, because then it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, when it says he came to them, I don't know if that means he just approached the entire crowd or if he's specifically talking to his disciples. I think it is probably aimed primarily at the apostles because they are the ones who are going to be the apostles, the early ministers, the pastors of the church. They're going to be the ones to get the whole ball rolling, if you will. And so it's very important. So what does he say to them? All authority in heaven and on earth. Go with me, if you would. I want you to look with me at Daniel chapter 7. Go back to the Old Testament to Daniel chapter 7. Because Daniel wrote many prophecies concerning the Messiah, the, uh, the church age, and the end of the church age. And so, if you look with me in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. In other words, what he's seeing is a vision of Christ Jesus in heaven. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So there you have, in the Old Testament, a prophecy given to Daniel about this coming time when Jesus would be uh, given this incredible and total authority over everything. Now, I want you to fast forward and go with me to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Go to the very end of the book, Revelation chapter 5. And I want us to read the fulfillment of that prophecy. Revelation chapter 5. Verses 1 through 7. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Now, stop and think for a moment. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Well, the Holy Spirit inspired John, the Apostle John, to write this. So, this is an interesting thing because you have these bookends, if you will, where you have Daniel, who was given this prophecy of Jesus in heaven being given all this authority, okay? And then on the other bookend, you have John, the apostle, who has been given this vision of Revelation, the things to come, where he sees Jesus in heaven fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel. And then right in the middle, you have John, while he's alive, in the presence of Jesus, while he's walking on the earth in his resurrected form, fulfilling, it's just a fascinating thing when you think about it. So continue reading with me in Revelation 5. John writes, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Yeah, he had been. Standing 
in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I want you to think about that. You have the prophecy of Daniel that Jesus Christ, this Son of Man, is going to be given all authority. It's all going to be handed over to him. In the book of Revelation, you see the finality of that, that yes, indeed, everything has been handed over to Jesus Christ. So in the middle of that, you have happening live and in person right now in Matthew 28, Jesus stands there and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he is, he is, um, uh, he is ratifying, if you will, the prophecy of Daniel and what hasn't yet at that point been written about the things to come that are in Revelation. So I want you to understand when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, he is speaking a royal decree. He is speaking a legal edict. He's basically telling, this is the law. This is it. This is the gospel truth. I am the authority figure. And there's scripture to back all of that up. Now, why does that matter? Because when we read that and we say, oh, all authority has been given to me, we tend to just skip over that and get on to what did he say. It's very important that you stop and understand. God Almighty has done something. I wrote down some other scripture, and I won't take the time for you to have to look these up, but I wrote them down because I wanted to read them to you. John 3, 35 says, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. John 5, 22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. John 17, 2 says, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says, For he has put everything under his feet. Ephesians 1, says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Hebrews 1, 2 says, But in these last days... He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Now stop for just one moment. When he says these last days, what have we learned about that? It doesn't necessarily mean like the very last few days before the second coming, but the last days in general applies to the church age. We've had all of the years, all of the ages of human history leading from Adam to all the way up to Jesus Christ, but from Jesus Christ until the tribulation and the second coming is the church age. And this is the last age. This is the last age of human history before God wraps it all up. And so what is Hebrews saying there? In this age, in this church age, God has spoken to us through Jesus. God spoke to his people previously. He spoke to Adam directly. He spoke to Abraham directly. He spoke to Moses directly. He spoke to his Jewish people through the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He's been speaking to the whole world through the Bible, through the scripture, through the prophets, through the whole thing. But since Jesus, he's been speaking to us through Christ, through Jesus through the final revelation, the final fulfillment, which is the New Testament. So you have the old and the new. You have all of the revelation of God, all of the complete message because of Jesus Christ. So he's telling us in this church age, we have the authoritative word of God through Jesus Christ and that Jesus is the heir of all things and it was even through him that the whole universe was created so that the author of Hebrews is reiterating the incredible authority of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus says here in Matthew 28, standing on this mountain in front of his apostles and probably 500 plus other people, and he says, 
all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He's not kidding. He's telling you everything that's going to happen from now to the end of human history is happening under my authority. I am in control. I'm in charge. That's a very big deal. So go with me in verse 19 because the very next thing that comes out of Christ's mouth is therefore. This is why you need to understand the significance of his authority. Because when he says therefore, what he's saying is because I have all of this authority. Because of what I just told you, therefore, you will go. Uh, I liken it to when you're raising your children, or in my case, when you're uh, close enough to, to, to be a participant in helping raise your grandchildren, which is a tremendous blessing. You uh, sometimes hear yourself saying, you know, why? Because I'm the father, because I'm your parent, because I'm your dada, I'm your grandfather, because I said so. I am the authority here. Therefore, you're going to eat your lunch. Therefore, you're going to clean up your room. We use this kind of language all the time. When we read it here, we sometimes apply it almost watered down into like human terms because we kind of flaunt authority here on the earth. Jesus is not a flaunting authority. He's just letting them know, as I already said, everything that happens in this church age happens under my authority. Nothing happens that I don't approve. Therefore, here's what you're going to do. Do you understand? He says, therefore, this is what you're going to do. Therefore, go. Go where? He says, Go and make disciples. Now, if you go back to the original language, you see that it's not actually, uh, when you render it into English, it has a little bit of a different twist on it. It kind of sounds like he's saying, okay, now you go, you leave here and go do this. But when you go to the original language, it's more of the, uh, the connotation that as you're going about your life, so I like that better because I think what Jesus was saying is you're going to go and live your life, okay? But as you're going and living your life, as you're going through life, guess what? You're going to be a disciple maker. As you're going through life, as you're working your job and tending your home and raising your family and doing all the things that you do, as you're going through life, you're going to make disciples. That means that it's not just for the called evangelists to go and make disciples. It's not just for those who are called to missionary work who will make disciples. He's saying to you and me, to the apostles, probably to the crowd that was around, to everybody who is a believer in Jesus Christ, guess what? While you're going about your life, you need to be going about the work of making disciples of all nations, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and guess what he else he said, and teaching them. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart, because I feel like in the modern church, I, I tend to think we may be in that age of apostasy, where people don't really want good teaching, and that's why I said, a lot of people show up to church on Sunday morning, who are not really committed to actually worship, I don't know why some people go, but some people go and, and I don't think they worship because it doesn't seem to have much effect on their life. It doesn't change how they are or who they are on Monday morning. And I have learned through my many years in the ministry, a lot of people unfortunately do not come to church to hear biblical truth. They've already made up their mind what they believe. They go to church to have somebody confirm it. And if the pastor or the preacher doesn't confirm what they believe, they'll go somewhere else and find somebody else. And they'll keep looking until they find somebody that will say what they want to hear. That's what the age of apostasy means. It doesn't mean people will quit going to church. It just means they will only go to the church that tells them what they agree with already. Because I'm telling you, when you really teach the Bible, when you really dig into what 
biblical Christianity is. It doesn't fit with a lot of Christians' uh, world system or their belief system. It can be quite challenging when you really study biblical Christianity. And this is why Jesus said, I don't want you to just go get people saved. I don't want you to just dunk them in the baptistry and say, good, now put them on the church roll. He says, I want you to go out and make disciples of them, which means you're going to teach them to obey everything I have commanded. How often do you hear that kind of talk in church circles? You will obey Jesus. But what did Jesus tell them? I have the authority. I'm the boss. I'm the boss of the universe right now. I'm the boss of this earth. I'm the boss in heaven. Nothing happens in this church age without my authority. Everything. Now, there's a lot of comfort for me in that. Because if Jesus is in charge of everything and he is in complete authority, it doesn't matter what happens to me. Even if Satan comes after me and attacks me, he's only doing what Jesus has allowed him to do. He is only on a leash as long or as short as Jesus allows. Jesus is ultimately the one who has the authority over me. I don't have to worry. Even as I've said before, the very worst thing that Satan could do to me physically would be to kill my body. And if that were allowed, if Jesus allowed Satan to do that, then my very next breath, I'm at the feet of Jesus. Hallelujah. I promise you I will not be upset about it. I'm not looking to die, but I'm just telling you that there is nothing that can happen to me that is not under the authority of Jesus, and there's nothing that can be done to me that's going to take away my salvation. There's nothing that Satan can do to me to ruin it for me. I'm safe because my Jesus is the boss. He's in authority, and that's what he's trying to tell them, and it's a very powerful message when he says, I'm the boss, therefore... He didn't say, I really wish that you would go out and make disciples. He didn't say, I really wish you would call some missionaries and send them out and make disciples. He's saying, because I'm the boss, while you're living your life, you're going to lead people to Christ. And you're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're going to teach them. You're going to disciple them. I want you to teach them everything that I've taught you and teach them to obey it. That means you teach them to say yes to this scripture. Now, I realize that's a difficult thing. A lot of people are simply not willing to go there. And that's okay. Jesus told us it would be that way. But he said, and this is the last thing he said here in chapter 28. He said, and surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. In other words, he's saying, until human history is all wrapped up, I'm with you. You're not alone. I'm not an absentee boss. I'm not going to give you my instructions and then be gone and you never see me again. I'm right here with you. How is he with us? The scripture teaches that Jesus Christ is literally the body. We, the church, are the body of Christ. We are in complete fellowship with him as believers. His spirit indwells us and indwells the church and guides us and leads us. We are very much led by Jesus Christ, our boss, our authority figure. And so... I want to close with Acts 1.8. This is something that Jesus also said. Acts 1.8, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What was he saying? He was saying, you're going to be my witnesses right here in this, in this city where you live. 
and you're going to be my witnesses in the whole country where you live, and you're going to be my witnesses in the country in the area right north of you, and you're going to be my witnesses everywhere. So what has Jesus, our authority figure, our boss, called us at First Baptist Church Bemis to be? We are called to be his witnesses here in South Jackson, in Madison County, in Tennessee, and to the extent that we can, to the United States and to the rest of the world. He is telling us that we are his witnesses. We are those who are called because we're saved, not because we're missionaries, not because we're evangelists, because we're called to be Christians. We are witnesses for our boss, for our supervisor, for our authority figure to go out on his behalf. And as we're going about our life, that we are to make disciples. Would you pray with me about that? Our Father, we thank you so much for this very powerful word in, in your scripture, Lord, for this beautiful, powerful words of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to apply these to our lives, Lord, that we would truly be going people and discipling people, Lord, that we would be teaching people Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us, and we pray and ask you to help us to be bold, to help us to have the skills that we need, to help us to have the words that we need, to have the right actions that we need, Father, to make this happen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you again next Sunday.